This is my Lincoln Town Car. But wait, before you keep scrolling, let me explain. While this car has the reputation for being just an old geezer hauler, it's more important and significant than you might think. And in this video, I'm going to tell you just why that is. Alright, now as I said, this is my 1994 Lincoln Town Car. I'd love to tell you that this car is rare in some way, or was first ever off the assembly line, but it wasn't. This car in particular is not special in that way. The reason it's significant is that this car represents the last good version of a now extinct breed of vehicle. On the surface, it's a body on frame sedan with a 4.6 liter naturally aspirated V8 under the hood that powers the rear wheels. The engine makes horsepower and torque that makes the car move. The acceleration characteristic can be described as steady but not rapid, and it does 0 to 60 in due time and can hold some level of G's in a corner. On paper, this car would be extremely lackluster if you judged it only by these modern day, shallow magazine based performance metrics too often used to benchmark one car to another today. However, this car's significance comes from the performance aspects of it that can't be quantified within a magazine spec table. This vehicle's performance is focused around its plush, cloud like ride with a large engine for effortless acceleration and large chassis dimensions to allow for spacious interior and road-dominating exterior. Plush, cloud-like, spacious, large. In its day, and for many decades leading up to this point, those were the adjectives that described luxury vehicles. To understand why this particular car is so significant, we need to take a look back at what was going on in the world and in the automotive industry leading up to and during the time when this Lincoln Town car was made, and what ultimately caused such a drastic shift away from cars like this within the industry in such a relatively short amount of time. In today's day and age, what does it mean for a vehicle to be luxurious? Excluding sports cars such as Porsches, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, etc., if you wanted to buy a daily driver luxury vehicle, what would that car look like? What's the platform? A Grand Touring Coupe? No, not so much these days. A sedan? Yeah, in some cases sure, such as the BMW 5 Series or 7 Series, or the Mercedes E-Class or S-Class. However, while those are very nice vehicles, they are largely overlooked in favor for another form of luxury vehicles these days. An SUV? Hey, there we go. The Audi Q8, the BMW X7, the Mercedes-Benz GLS, and countless others. Those are great examples of today's luxury vehicles. And what about them makes them luxurious? Well, they're practical for a family, they sit up high, and yet they have sporty dynamics and can run impressive 0-60 to times for being the size and weight that they are. They have the latest tech, such as the latest self-driving features. They also have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto with big screens in the center console and gauge cluster to make them feel like the iPhones and iPads we love so much. Then maybe throw in some leather heated and cooled massage seats and a heated steering wheel and we have what many would consider to be a top of the line luxury car. Now in the time of my town car, none of the aforementioned characteristics are what made it one of the industry leading luxury vehicles. In its day, and for nearly a century leading up to that point, the formula for a luxury vehicle consisted of being a large sedan with a big engine, vault-like build quality, a soft cloud-like ride, plush pillow top seats, over assisted power steering, and a touch of the latest tech to come together for a very comfortable, enjoyable, and effortless place to spend time while driving from A to B. So what is it that caused the shift from that being the definition of a luxury vehicle to today's definition of luxury vehicles over the course of just a couple of decades? Well, strap in for a bit of a history lesson because here we go. Alrighty, now let's go back in time a little bit. It was the early 1970s. Large cars of all kinds were the norm. Gas was cheap and fuel economy was the last thing on people's minds. Then, in 1973, the first of two oil crises hit. Oil prices rose dramatically and fuel was very difficult to come by. Fallout from this crisis eventually led the government to pass the Energy Policy Conservation Act, which created the Corporate Average Fuel Economy Standards, or CAFE as they're better known. The intention of these regulations were to indirectly incentivize customers to purchase vehicles that got better fuel economy by penalizing manufacturers when less fuel efficient vehicles were sold, hence raising the sticker price of less efficient vehicles for the customer. Over the following decade, after this first oil crisis, auto manufacturers moved towards developing smaller, more economical vehicles as regulations tightened, and gas prices rose in the wake of the second oil crisis that caused increased fuel prices through the middle of the 1980s. In the wake of this, the big three U.S. auto manufacturers, Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, 
traditionally known for making big, floaty, inefficient land yachts, had to pivot towards making smaller vehicles with downsized engines fit with emissions devices that hurt reliability and power output. As a result, traditional luxury car customers were not happy with the new CAFE-compliant vehicles coming from the U.S. The Europeans, and eventually the Japanese luxury brands, began to get a foothold in the U.S. market. These companies were accustomed to making inherently smaller, somewhat sportier, and more fuel-efficient vehicles for their own respective markets. Less of a pivot was required on their part to make them meet the U.S. regulations. Hence, being able to introduce a new breed of luxury vehicles into the U.S. market, which were less compromised to meet emissions, yet very luxurious vehicles. That, coupled with steady economic growth throughout much of the 1980s and again through much of the 1990s, meant that U.S. customers had more disposable income to afford the higher price tag of European and Japanese vehicles. As a result, the U.S. luxury brands suffered greatly. Here, you can see the steady sales decline in the U.S. luxury OEM brand sales from the mid-1980s through to today, while European and Japanese brands gained significant market share and outsold the American brands. Fallout from this meant that U.S. companies had less capital to invest in improving their luxury vehicles, while the foreign companies continued to push the envelope. The injection of a certain level of sportiness into the luxury vehicles meant that people paid more attention to the performance numbers of their everyday drivers, something previously reserved for muscle car and sports car enthusiasts. This increased awareness of performance figures meant that auto manufacturers were continuously making their cars faster and faster year over year to distinguish their products from their competitors. This phenomenon is the reason why the industry would eventually see luxury sedans and SUVs with sports car features such as stiff suspension and bolstered seats. So, that explains the shift away from the U.S. land yachts in favor of sportier luxury vehicles made by European and Japanese competitors. But why the eventual redefinition of a luxury vehicle away from the plush riding land yachts towards the tech-focused luxury SUVs of today? Well, let's pick up in the mid-1990s. My town car, a 1994 model year car, was four years into its eventual seven-year run. This car does have some tech. It has a car phone, which had been seen in cars for several years at that point, but was still considered to be cutting edge. It also had a fully digital gauge cluster, automatic headlights, memory seats, a soft closed trunk, and automatic climate control. These are other features that, although seen in other cars leading up to that point, were still considered to be very advanced for the time. Aside from that, the luxury features of this car were centered around the traditional characteristics of having a very plush, floaty ride to keep occupants in complete comfort. On the note of technology, this car was made just five years before the first BlackBerry came out, which gave rise to the first generation of smart-ish phone and, subsequently, our obsession with technology. Just two years after that, in 2001, BMW released the E65 7 Series, which featured the OEM's first-generation iDrive. While this was a fairly controversial system, it was one of the first vehicles to have what is known today as an infotainment system, where all of the vehicle's functions are controlled within a central screen, radio, HVAC, GPS, vehicle settings, etc. Quick side note fun fact. The first ever vehicle with an infotainment system is widely considered to be the 1986 Buick Riviera. This vehicle featured Buick's Graphic Control Center, which was a touchscreen controlled system that integrated things like the trip computer, HVAC controls, vehicle diagnostic messages, etc. As smartphones continued to advance, then the eventual release of the iPhone in 2007, consumers demanded more and more tech within their infotainment systems, and eventually, this became the primary focus when evaluating a vehicle's interior. This was good and bad for car companies. On one hand, developing infotainment systems was very challenging. This is the reason why, up until Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, infotainment systems were... Well, clunky and terrible, with each OEM coming up with their own solution for how to move between menus and control vehicle functions. This created many marketability issues for OEMs, with infotainment being a primary focus in customer surveys such as JD Power Initial Quality Survey. However, because infotainment was such a primary focus of the vehicle, this meant that costs could be cut in other areas, kind of a smoke and mirrors effect to developing a vehicle which meant that things like build quality and ride quality could take a bit of a back seat as long as the car incorporated the latest cutting-edge technology. But what about the departure from sedans? Up until this point, the sedan was very much still the flagship. Well, for that, let's back up once more. Up until the mid-1980s, SUVs were very utilitarian vehicles. Big sellers were vehicles like the Ford Bronco and the Chevy K5 Blazer. These vehicles, while utilitarian, were essentially pickup trucks with hard tops covering the beds. 
Many had just two doors, making traveling as a family awkward and difficult. Additionally, the idea of them being luxurious was not even on the map. Of course, there were larger vehicles like the Chevy Suburban and Jeep Wagoneer, but consumers with families oftentimes opted for minivans over larger body-on-frame SUVs due to the difficulty of getting smaller children in and out of such tall vehicles. In the mid-1980s, the second-generation Jeep Cherokee was released. The Cherokee featured a unibody architecture as opposed to being body-on-frame architecture. This vehicle is one of the first to set the stage for the modern SUV. Around the same time, the Chevy Blazer was released, and then... In the early 1990s, the Ford Explorer was released. With these three vehicles on the market and consumers loving sitting high off the ground, combined with great practicality of hauling their things and their family, and the perception of better safety as a result of driving a larger vehicle, SUVs became widely adopted. However, they were still not considered to be luxurious. Eventually, towards the end of the 1990s, the idea of luxury SUVs began to take off. One game-changing vehicle was the Lexus RX300 a crossover SUV that became a huge success for Toyota and set the stage for countless other luxury SUV models. As you can see here, Lexus RX sales rose rapidly from its first model year and continued to sell well for many years to come. For reference, you can see the Lincoln Town Car sales here from 1994 to the end of the vehicle's production. In the case of my 1994 Town Car, while it's not the last generation of the town car, it was the last generation of the town car before the automotive industry's shift towards tech-heavy luxury SUVs. The following generation of the town car was not nearly as special compared to previous generations. It went from being a car that offered cutting-edge tech compared to the rest of the auto industry to being severely lacking compared to vehicles that were sold at the same time. Within just a few years, the Lincoln Town Car went from a highly respected cutting-edge luxury vehicle to being an outdated, rebadged geezer cruiser. When put into the context of the automotive industry at the time, and considering it is quite literally a bookend on an entire era of luxury vehicles, this vehicle will go down in history as being one of the industry's last great vehicles from the American land yacht glory years. I hope you enjoyed that little uh, somewhat ASMR-ish segment there of getting into the Lincoln. But I just figured, since we're talking about the raw luxury of this vehicle being in its you know, vault-like build quality and just the, the overall way that this vehicle is, it's not so much in a particular material type or the technology in the center console or anything like that, it's just the way that the car is. In an effort to communicate that to you guys, I did the cringy thing of making one of those video segments where, you know, you're opening the door handle, you're putting the key in, you're putting it in drive. But anyway, here we are just cruising along in absolute comfort. As we float along going down this country road, I just want to say this is exactly what this car uh, is meant for. This is, this is this car's environment. Anything from a you know, 55 mile an hour country road to you know, a 70 mile an hour highway. It's meant to get up to speed. It does so with a feeling of just pure effortlessness. Uh, and then, you know, you just set the cruise control and enjoy the ride. That's what this thing's all about. And it does so, so well. It's just such a different level of automotive enthusiasm. Not a different level, it's just a very different like subcategory. You know, a lot of times, like when I'm driving my 911, the last thing I want to do is be just on a straight country road or go down the highway in that thing. I want to be going through some sweet curvy roads. This thing is the exact opposite. No, this thing's forte is absolutely just cruising down the road. They don't make cars this way anymore. They just don't. It's, it, it's just not the formula. You know, it's all about Nürburgring lap times and zero to 60 times and does the car have Apple CarPlay? And does it have the latest generation of lane keep assist and adaptive cruise and all this bull crap? Who cares? Hey, it's a car. Drive your freaking car. Even though this thing isn't some sports car that carves up curvy roads super well, the common denominator between sports cars and this is that it is a driver's car. It's just a different category of driver's car. It 
is so enjoyable to drive and enjoy the drive in it in the same way that you do when you're flying through corners on a, on a curvy road in a Porsche 911. So with that, let's drive. It is a driver's car, and it's not what we normally think of as a driver's car, but it is absolutely 100% a driver's car. Anyway, that's my Lincoln Town car. I hope you enjoyed the background on this car. Um, and hey, do me a quick favor. If you've made it through this far in the video, comment the words town car down below. I like to know just how many people are still hanging on to the end of my videos, especially one like this where I've never done a video of this format before. So I don't know if you guys are enjoying it. I don't know if you're not, um, but please comment the word town car if you've still hung on to this point in the video. And also do me a huge favor and hit that like button if you're still here. I would uh, super, super, super appreciate it. It really helps my channel out a lot and it just lets me know that you guys uh, enjoy what I'm making. So with that, thank you all so much for tuning into Fun Ahead TV, and I will see you guys next time.